This morning we consider these scripture lessons for the third Sunday in the season of Easter. Our first lesson from Acts chapter 4. Jesus is not only alive, but he was also empowering his disciples. They healed a crippled man and announced where that power came from. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And our service this morning continues with our second lesson, from 1 John chapter 1. Some have said you can almost picture John thinking about seeing Jesus and maybe even seeing him and, and even touching him in this lesson. It's correct that they would not only see this, but they would also share it. And so we eagerly also share Jesus, who is the light of the world. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. That life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Our hearts were burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. Alleluia. Please stand for the gospel reading. We consider these words today from Luke chapter 24. Here Jesus shows himself again to be alive. He even eats a piece of broiled fish. Jesus lives just as he promised. While they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. 
This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we'll consider these words from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may praise your, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, do you want to get involved? What kinds of groups motivate you? What, what kinds of causes get you excited? You know, I was looking, and there's there's a a group for almost everything nowadays. Um, there's a group right now that's fighting for the ethical treatment of plants. There's another group that is concerned that snakes are always portrayed negatively in movies, and they're fighting to change that. There's another group that wants to make sure things stay dark at night. True. You probably didn't realize this, but there's a group called the International Dark Sky Association. And today, April 15th, is the beginning of Dark Sky Week from April 15th to April 21st. It's a group that is active. They're trying to make sure that the sky stays dark. They're concerned about all these different light emissions that are taking place, and they're concerned the effect that it's going to have on stargazing. Maybe that's a group you want to get involved in. But before you say that you do and you sign up, today we're going to listen for a little bit to what Jesus has to say. Because Jesus actually would urge us to go the other direction, not to let people stay in the dark, but rather he tells us today that you are the light of the world, and he calls on us to use that light to make a difference in people's lives. So we'll consider that as we look at this this morning. You know, when you think about the Bible, there is this continual picture of darkness and light. And it's used over and over again in many different books by many different authors. And it helps us to understand really what the struggle is, right? Because in this passage, this first one I'll read, it's from uh, the Apostle Paul, and he says life is a struggle. But he says, life might not be the struggle that you think it is, or it may not be, you need to understand what's going on behind the scenes. This is what he says. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly realms. Paul says, life is a struggle. But it's not really a struggle so much against other people. That, that other student that it's hard to get along with in school, that person that you work with that you just can't seem to say eye to eye on. That's not really the battle. He says the battle is against the darkness in this world. And he says it's against the spiritual forces of evil. You know what he's saying there. He's saying the real battle is against the prince of darkness. It's against the devil. It's against the devil and all his allies who want to keep people in the dark. Right? The prince of darkness loves things like destruction and death and darkness and contrast that to the light of the world who loves things like life and love and light we're part of sort of a, a cosmic war that's going on between Jesus and the devil and you see it all around and sometimes, you believe it or not, instead of people wanting to go to the light, they actually gravitate towards the darkness. You remember this passage from John chapter 3? It says, this is judgment. The light has come into the world, 
But men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You see what he's saying? He said you'd think that people would want to go into the light, but actually it's just the opposite. He said when people do things that are wrong, when they do things that are sinful and evil, they want to go into the darkness so that they can hide those things, so that nobody can see what they're doing. He said, and then as a result, people love the darkness, not the light. And then he says that darkness also has power in a person's light, life because it seeks to infiltrate as well. It doesn't just stay out there, it, it goes inside. And that's what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 1. He said, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but their thinking became foolish. And their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, the Bible says there's darkness out there. But he says that darkness wants to infiltrate a person's life. It wants to fill a person's heart with darkness. You see, that's the battle that's going on. And it's going on all around us. And it's been going on from the beginning of time. Maybe that's the way, the reason God even made a period of light and a period of dark, because we can see that battle. Every single day we wake up, right? There's a period of dark, and then there's a period of light, which gives way to a period of dark again. It's kind of like what's going on in the world. This constant battle of darkness versus light. Of truth versus falsehood. Of love versus hatred. And you know, the reality is, is people were not designed to live in the dark. I, I've read about this study from 1965. These two cave explorers, a man and a woman, Josie Loris and Antoine Senny, they both decided to, to try this to see what would happen. And they went down deep into some dark cave. They, didn't, they lived in separate caves, even. The, the lady, Josie, was down there for 88 days, almost for three months. And Antoine was uh, down there for 126 days, over four months, just in the dark, all by themselves. They wanted to see what would the darkness, what would isolation, living all by themselves, do to them personally. Well, here are some of the things they found. They discovered that when they came back up out of the cave, they had like no sense of time. They were completely confused about what time it was. They said that when Antoine went to sleep, he'd sleep for 30 hours at a time and think he had just taken a brief nap. They said that when they were down there, they were so lonely, they were trying to make friends with the mice. And so Josie was able to make friends with this one little mouse. Antoine was trying to, to, to get a mouse too to be his friend. He put jelly on the floor of the cave and then when the mouse came up to eat it, he tried to catch it, but he was so disoriented, he had this plate, he actually smashed the, smashed the rodent and it died. So he spent the rest of the time by himself. People aren't designed to live in the dark. You're not designed to live in darkness. That's why these words today are so important for us to hear. When Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That Jesus says, I've come to bring light into the world. And if you listen to me, if you follow me, if you trust in me, he says, I'll fill your life with light. No clearer is that for us right now is when we're in the Easter season, right? Celebrating not only the truth that Jesus came into the world to die on the cross for our sins, but also that he's alive, that he's ruling, that he's giving his disciples power in the world, that he's giving them a message to go and speak. No clearer is it now that, that Jesus is the light of the world when we see that he's alive and we can see his love for us. But the Bible takes this to the very next step. Because Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But if you listen to these words from Matthew, you know what Jesus said? He said, you're the light of the world. 
You see, Jesus is the light of the world, but when he shines his light on us, he says, we become the light of the world. Maybe again, maybe this was God's design in creation. There's the sun, which is the light, but in the evening, we can see the moon, and it reflects the light of the sun. Maybe God was giving us a picture of what he wants to do in our lives. The Son of God has come. And he shines his light, his life, his love into our lives. And now we get to reflect that to others. We're not coming up with love and life and light on our own. We're just reflecting the love and life and light that Christ has already filled us with. So he says, you are the light of the world. And then he says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and honor your Father in heaven. And then maybe the Bible even takes it a step further. Because if you've been reading through the book of Revelation, maybe you remember this. Do you remember what they called churches in Revelation? They call them lampstands. Lights. He says the church is a light. So this is the progression. He says, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, but when I come and touch you, you're the light of the world, and when you gather together as a church, your church is the light of the world. And so your church has been designed to break up the darkness, to teach the truth, to fill the world with love and with life. You know, it's interesting, over this past weekend, we had grandparents day, always a fun day, Church is filled with grandparents and, and students all together. And uh, this year we did something a little bit different. We asked the grandparents to bring in some historical item. And so a lot of, a lot of them did brought pictures and other things. But um, someone brought in actually a, sort of like a family history, pages and pages of pictures and stories. Uh, and, all. and it's just really interesting at, because you were able to read about uh, Nodine, able to read about St. John's from 50 years ago able to read about uh, St. John's from a hundred years ago. And it, it's actually, it's all the same names, same people for the last hundred years. <laughs> but, uh, but this year our church is celebrating 140 years. It was back in 1878 that our congregation started, 140 years ago. Nice think about what a, a neat thing that is. How God has kept this lampstand here for our, our parents and our grandparents, maybe our great grandparents. You know, five, six, seven generations. God has been shining his light in our community. And then sometimes you, you kind of wonder, you know, you think that will continue for another five, six, or seven? Generations. I mean, you know how things are going. You know how things are going culturally in our world today. You know the kinds of things that are taking place. Do you think the church will still be here? In five generations or six, in another 140 years, do you think it will still be showing the light of the world? Or do you think it's just going to slowly succumb to the darkness like so many other things. You know, if Jesus has anything to say about it, it will still keep showing the light, won't it? Because he is the light of the world. And it's through the power of his word that he continues to touch individual people's lives and hearts and break up the darkness that is within them with the light of his truth and love. So if Jesus has anything to say, his word of life and love will continue to be proclaimed faithfully to the very end. But that's the challenge, I guess, for us in every generation. 
Will that be the cause that inspires us? Will that be the thing that we fight for, that we stand for, that we give to, that we work toward? Will that be the cause that inspires us? Or will we get inspired by a hundred other things going on in the world, which might have some value, but may not have a whole lot of eternal value. What will be the thing? You know, Jesus reminds us today that he has already shattered the darkness with his life, death, and resurrection. That the victory is already won, and that through faith, the victory is also ours. And that when we walk with him, he fills us with light so that we can reflect his light for the little bit of time we have left on this earth and maybe make a difference in someone else's life. And maybe through our work here at St. John's, we can impact the next generation or the next generation or the next generation. Just like St. John's has been doing for many generations. What a privilege God gives us to be reflectors of his true light. Because we weren't designed to live in the dark. If I just close this today, I read this story, uh, it's actually a pretty long story, uh, written by a lady. She's, the title of it was Darkness to Light. And she starts out telling the story that she was a nurse. Um, she had completed two different degrees in nursing. Um, she was started in um, intensive care, she said, and, and soon she became kind of working in an area of notoriety. She started to get on a bunch of different boards, pretty influential person. Then she started writing some books. She became a very uh, sought-after speaker in her field, kind of at the top of her career, if you will. On the, everything looked great on the outside of her life. But she said on the inside of her life was complete chaos and turmoil. She said she reached a point in her life where she couldn't go more than six hours without a drink. And that she could only function normally when she was intoxicated. And so it happened when her second husband told her he was going to ask for a divorce that she just went out on a binge and then she got arrested and then she went to jail and then she was super angry and she said I, I angrily blamed my husband my parents society the church the law and anything but myself for my current situation. But while she sat in jail, she discovered that jail for her was not a place of darkness. It was actually a place of light. Because it was there in jail that she came to know who Jesus was. It was there in jail that another woman sat down with her and walked her through the scriptures and taught her about her Savior. And then she got so involved that she started getting involved in all these groups in prison. In this place of darkness, it became for her a place of light because Jesus was there. And it created a huge change, and, and that now continues to be her passion in life. That Jesus has touched her heart and changed her by his power through his word. He's broken up the darkness and filled her with light. And our question today is, is what's your passion? What's the cause you're going to fight for? What's the thing that's going to inspire you? Today, our Lord says this. I'm the light of the world. You're the light of the world. 
Your church is the light of the world. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. May God give us the strength to do just that. May the peace of God which passes our human understanding guard our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.